Well, you're looking at a retired, reformed, unrepentant rocket scientist. I retired from IBM in 1993 after 32 years. I'm unrepentant because the project I worked on were some of the most important and most interesting of the 20th century. I helped put men on the moon in the 60s. I was responsible for design of the global positioning system, GPS. Those were highlight programs for me. Today, I'm not going to talk about any of that. Today, I'm going to talk about highlights that have occurred since that retirement. I'll tell you about highlights, and then I'll explain the consequences, which I call saving the good stuff. We'll be talking about three or four highlights until they kick me off. Well. I was going to be a weaver the rest of my life. Retired to little Switzerland up in the mountains here and was making rectangles at a furious pace. <laughs> my sister Kit came to visit from Cary, North Carolina. Judy and I were pretty happy doing the things that we were doing. Judy's in the back. We've been married 51 years now. Sister Kit came to visit on a Wednesday. I know for sure it was Wednesday. If it had been any other day of the week or any other week of the year, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here on this stage today. She watched me weave for maybe five minutes, got bored, said I was the only left brain type A weaver she'd ever seen. <laughs> Adding insult to injury, she sat down and read the Spruce Pine newspaper. Comes out one day a week, 12 pages if it was a busy week. She read clear to the back and she saw an ad for the orchard at Alta Pass. Well, we'd known about the orchard at Alta Pass because it's been a landmark on the Blue Ridge Parkway uh, for as long as the parkway's been there. The orchard's been there longer. We saw the land was being offered for sale at a very reasonable price. 288 acres at the cost of a single acre house in Spruce Pine. We were afraid if we didn't step in and buy it, somebody would, and this two mile stretch of the Blue Ridge Parkway on both sides of the parkway would be developed. So after two hours of due diligence, <laughs> which consisted mainly of going to the orchard to make sure it was the one we thought we would be buying, we called the man on the telephone and bought the farm. Well, there, there it is. The parkway was in more danger than we knew. We found out later we were not the first or the second caller, even though we'd called on the day the ad appeared in the Spruce Pine newspaper. We were the fifth caller. The first four were on his answering machine, and we bought the farm carefully chosen words. <laughs> so after we bought it, one of the first four callers told us he had already done an aerial survey. He'd already laid out across the top of the parkway there 140 lots, and all we had to do was sell him five acres to get him started, and he would pay us more than we paid for the whole 288 acres. My sister, who actually had bought the farm, said, no, our dream was different. He kept raising the price. She got concerned about that. She was afraid one of hers or our heirs might be tempted. So she worked with the Conservation Trust in North Carolina and sold that property to them for a pittance compared to what the developer would have given. And they gave it to the Blue Ridge Parkway. So half of the orchard, the part above the parkway, the part behind me in that picture, is parkland. Well, Judy and I looked at each other and said, well, how hard can it be to keep growing apples? 
bad choice. <laughs> now we know why he was selling it so cheap. Well, in some ways, speaking from experience, it's easier to get men on the moon than to grow apples on the Blue Ridge. <laughs> this cold snap we had last week, we're down to about a 20% crop. Well, <clears throat> this marked a transition, part of my reformation. I had gone from IBM to Apple. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry for that pun. <laughs> Local historian Harley Jolly told us we'd bought historically the most active place on the Blue Ridge. And now, after 17 years of listening, learning, reading, I can uh, justify what he said. We found a spear point nearby that dated back to the last ice age. And if there is a, yes, how about that? A Palmer Point. This Alta Pass orchard and this Alta Pass site is active because it is the lowest point in the Continental Divide and a good river close by, one going east and one going west. So it's been a passage since the ice age. It was also the place chosen for a revolution, the Industrial Revolution. The Clinchfield Railroad crossed under the property that is now the orchard, and I think we've got a picture of that. Yeah. And brought the Industrial Revolution to the Southern Appalachians and carried back our coal, and it's been burning for 100 years now. 15 trains a day, 100 car loads of coal on each train. A lot of coal and Kentucky has been burned. But the revolution that I've been interested in is not that one. It's the American Revolution. And we can change, yeah, we'll come back to the view here. On the 29th of September in 1995, in my first uh, season at the orchard, I was sitting on the front porch of that red building and hoping that we might have some customers that day. Down the road, coming toward me, looked like 18 customers. As they got closer, I saw they were armed. <laughs> Big old long rifles. When they got up real close, I saw they were dressed like 1780. And I learned that they were reenacting the March 2 and the battle at King's Mountain. A battle that Thomas Jefferson said changed the course of the Revolutionary War to our favor. It's not what they taught me up north. <laughs> it's not even what they're teaching us down south. A sad point. So one of the things that we reserved or decided to do was to take this lesson that I've been learning about the Revolutionary War and make sure the kids knew of their heritage. This is a picture that supports that. We had about 2,000 kids a year come through the orchard and we try to keep them going on the, their own history. The reason I'm so fascinated by that history is because I learned the story, I tell it to everybody. It's a great story. It's got traitors and girlfriends and hardship and heroism and I don't have time to tell it. <laughs> but I'll tell you how it ended. A 62-year-old man named Robert Young shot the British commander, Ferguson, with a rifle he called the same nickname he called his wife, Sweet Lips. <laughs> I tell that story every chance I get, and I told it to an aunt of mine shortly before she died, and she said, Lawsy child, don't you know? You're telling a story about your own great, 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 great grandfather. I was astonished. The first coincidence, the first memory, the first highlight was buying that orchard and making the call at exactly the time we did. The second, the second highlight was learning that I was telling stories about my own ancestors without knowing it. That changed my life again. No longer was I an apple grower. Now we've turned that into a nonprofit and I'm a philanthropist. 
preserving not only the land, but the history and also the culture of the Blue Ridge. We found out shortly after we moved here that the Blue Ridge has the richest musical heritage of any place I've ever lived. If a person doesn't play an instrument, then they sing. And if they don't sing, they dance. And if they don't do that, well, the music is still an active sport on the Blue Ridge. So we, uh, well, Judy laughs at me because after we got the orchard, we bought a sound system before we bought a case register. She knew what we were in for. Now she runs the music program. We have 150 performances a year in our six month season. All of it free by more than 60 groups of local musicians trying to preserve the local music. It's free because we believe that if it weren't free, it would become what we could sell to the tourists coming down the parkway, not the music of the community. So come hear our music. Well, a highlight for me in all of that was I learned to dance. It took a long time. It took a lot of failures. It, uh, well, I couldn't learn from teachers, but I did learn from an old gentleman who told me the secret of dancing. And get your pencil out. Mike said you had to write stuff down. Here is a life lesson for you. There are only three things, and especially you men, there are only three things you need to know about dancing. One, make your feet hit the floor on the beat. Good idea. Two, mo smile. Three, most important, remember they only watch the good dancers. <laughs> so, so I learned to dance. And, and I'm only doing it because Stephen said I had to move. <laughs> Cultural things came a little harder for us to learn. I, uh, well, I'm not from here. You could probably tell from my dancing. <laughs> or maybe my accent. Not from here in, in the mountains in North Carolina are only tolerated reluctantly by the from here's. And that's for good reason. We change the culture. We're impatient. We throw our money around. We don't necessarily bring our heart to the mountains. And so they tolerate us. The botanists along the parkway have a name for plants that are growing that aren't native. Kudzu comes to mind. They're called exotics. Well, I think that applies to people and I'm an exotic and my, I am my own worst example of why exotics are not tolerated very well. And it's this, before we bought the house that we lived in, before we retired and came to the mountains, we decided on that house and we were anxious to get started on the construction. I called the lawyer to see if it was now ours. He said, no, you need one more paper from the surveyor. We called the surveyor, didn't get him, got his wife. She's his office manager, she said. And she knew the paper and she'd get it out to the lawyer the next day. Judy and I worried about that because the surveyor had taken six months to do a one-day job. Would he be prompt with the letter? We didn't know. We went the next day to try to find his house, which we did. We, when I went to the door, it was neither the surveyor nor his wife. It was her mother who was their landlady. She said she knew the office and would help me, and I explained to her the importance of the paper. We walked down to the office, looked through all the stuff, couldn't find the paper. Told her again how important it was to get that paper done before I had to go back to Washington to my job on Labor Day. Well, we walked back out to the door. She, uh, we, as we were saying goodbye, I told her again, very important to get that paper. She'd understood me the first time. She tolerated me the second time. And the third time, she said these words. Well, if and they said they do it, they will. But normally, time don't hurry them none. Those words have echoed around all the way back to Washington and through the years. And you know, what they meant was, 
we have a value of time in this culture that says my time is my most valuable possession. It's mine. But we exotics divide our time up into small chunks and sell it to people and let them set our priorities. So I was learning. And as I thought about it, saving the good stuff has as its first step, you need to be in control of your own time and not let the exotics of your life set your priorities. Well, to me, this whole thing has sort of come together. I was really excited when we bought the orchard and it resulted not only in the 288 acres that we bought being preserved, but the Conservation Trust in North Carolina got interested and more than 2,000 more acres have been added to this beautiful place. And then we started learning about the history and kids started coming through and families and now we've been working with them to tell them about their own history. And you know, the culture, the cornerstone of the culture is the music. And we're working to preserve that. That's a losing battle. Over time, the kids are not taken up where their parents did in that music. We'll help keep it going as long as we can. But you know, it all sort of comes together for me as I recently stumbled across a a quotation from an early 20th century New England minister. He said this. He said, the heart has eyes the brain knows nothing of. And this reformed rocket scientist has come to realize that if we're going to save the good stuff, we have to do it by paying attention to both heart and brain. And when that comes to a conclusion, we have to act. Thank you.